Hi everyone, thanks for uh, thanks for listening. Uh, today I'm speaking with Nadia Oedat. Uh, Nadia is a PhD in Oriental Studies from Oxford. She is an assistant professor at Kansas State University. She is a Middle East fellow at New America Institute, and she's the chairman of the advisory board for Ideas Beyond Borders, uh, which is an amazing organization. Uh, so you should all check it out. And you've also authored. Um, a case study, or I, I don't know if it's a book or if it's just a paper called the Kafia Movement about the mm-hmm. um, reform movement. I guess it was part of the uh, the Arab Spring uh, in Egypt. Actually, it predates the Arab Spring by quite a few years. But uh, I grew up in the Middle East, so I believe that I was, I am part of that generation that wants freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom, political freedoms, personal freedoms. And the struggle continues. So I, I believe that the demonstrations, the Kifaya movement, the, the, uh, that, that it was a beginning of something big. I believed it was very symbolic because at the time, I know now Egypt is a lot worse, but at the time it was very clear that if people, if people were willing to risk so much to demonstrate, to say no to tyranny, they have reached the edge. So I believe this is really significant and is worthy of studying. So since then, the Arab Spring took place, and it continues to take place. It, I don't believe it is dead. I believe it's just a starting. It started in, in 2011, and it continues. Now uh, uh, Algeria and, and Sudan are at the forefront. But I don't believe that the, the brilliant young people, many of which I'm interviewing for a book I'm writing, I don't believe they will rest until there's real democracy, real freedoms, political and uh, personal, in the Arabic-speaking world. Um, okay, just staying on that, if you could go back and maybe give a little bit of your background, because you know, you'd mentioned growing up in the Middle East, I believe you are from Jordan? I am from Jordan, yes. Uh, so if you can give a bit of your background and what led you to studying this, and maybe about, because you don't really hear it. I mean, we, we'll hear about certain people like um, Raif Badawi, um, you know, I'm trying to think of a few others. Like we hear of so few people in the Middle East who are free thinkers who are actually, you know, calling for this kind of change, and it, they kind of get lost in the shuffle. Uh, sadly, yes, there's there's a tendency, especially in the West, to focus either on the dictators, with this uh, false premise that they are they offer stability versus extremists such as ISIS or uh, whatever the name is because they come in different names and shades and uh, variations within extremism. But in fact, there's a majority between these two extremes. A majority that wants to live, again, a dignified living, that wants uh, to be able to contribute. People want to be able to contribute to their countries, be able to compete on their merits, uh, be able to enjoy their natural resources, be able to vote leaders in and vote them down if they do not deliver on the economic premises. And these people are rarely, sometimes some scholars have have uh, wrote about them, but it, it, they really rarely make news. But when they do, it, it certainly, for me as, as a, a scholar of the Middle East, I, I really look for these. Yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of the times when they make the news, it's not for the right reasons. It's for the fact that they're being imprisoned or tortured or killed or, you know, we don't hear about them before they become a cause celeb. You know, we don't hear about them when they're right. actually doing the work. I mean, but I'm Obeid, I'm really grateful for the media that actually picks up the stories of these people. Mm-hmm. Like, for example, the New York Times, the Washington Post spoke recently about the Saudi activists who are jailed and tortured and harassed because of their uh, activism or who disappeared, like uh, one brilliant young man I interviewed, actually, as part of uh, the book I mentioned. My work in title is A Million Click to Freedom. Uh, so when a brilliant young man I, I met was Fahd al Bateri, and I do actually have online uh, a session I did with him jointly at the Middle East Institute, if anybody is interested in, in watching that. And his wife, Lujain, who's an activist for women's rights in Saudi, she's in jail, she's Human Rights Watch, um, stated that she's being uh, harassed and tortured. Her husband disappeared. 
there are rumors that they the the state forced them to divorce each other. They, they've had a beautiful love story as two young people in their twenties, making phenomenal difference and and being peace uh, peaceful role models for a whole generation. Uh, Fahad uh, contributed to creating all sorts of uh, YouTube channels, for example, and he, he's, he uses comedy. Uh, again, if anybody is interested in seeing something he participated in doing, uh, there's a very funny song called No Woman, No Drive, <laughs> make, making fun of the restrictions on women driving in Saudi. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so these activists are really risking their lives. Often they have choices. They could go to the West. But they choose to to remain in the Middle East and, and fight the honest fight, and uh, sadly, they they often pay very dearly for it. And I'm really grateful for media outlets like the New York Times and Washington Post and any other media outlet that draw attention to their plight and their struggle. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. There. Are, I. Kudos to whenever that's done, and it should be applauded. But I mean, um, something you mentioned there that you know they want to stay and help improve their countries and their region. And you hear on the other side, like a lot of it, oh, we have to help, like especially um, since that uh, young woman, Rahaf, finally made it to Canada. Um, yes. she was, and then ever since then you've been hearing, oh, we have to help all these Saudi women escape Saudi Arabia. And I, I actually I, believe there is a cause for also sometimes escaping because especially with women, like if, if you were there, if I was stuck in a Middle Eastern country, there is no way I'd be able to self-actualize, okay. get, a, Please, get a higher I, education. I, I'm not, I'm not going to argue against any of that, what, but mm. what my thing was, yes, if they, you know, these people need help, if we can help them, let's get them out, let's get them, but wouldn't it be better to spend some of that energy on trying to work from outside to get that system changed as opposed to, let's just pull everyone out of there a hundred percent a hundred percent with you because uh as as a western foreign policy especially american foreign policy but really western foreign policy in general we have somehow believed that having an alliance with authoritarian regimes that make uh their countries living hell for their people that such an alliance is good for the west that it brings stability but in fact all it brings is uh, unrest, sometimes civil wars, sometimes uh, uh, extremist um, extremist groups, etc. A whole uh, gambit, which makes people desperate to leave. So then Europe complains about millions of of people, especially from Muslim countries, wanting to leave because we have had that bargain to give these dictators weapons, enable them. So uh, many Western countries, the U.S. included sadly choose to enable and empower authoritarian regimes <clears throat> that make their countries living hell for, for many young people that want to leave. So it would definitely be a lot wiser to not engage with these regimes that make their countries living hell for a lot of their mainly young people. 40, 80% of the Arabic-speaking world, for example, is under uh, under 40 years old. Uh, 70% is under 30 years old. So a majority young population between 15 and uh, 30 is a significant, you know, that young people, when, when, when England had a youth bulge, like what the, what the Middle East is, is experiencing, they had the Industrial Revolution. They became one of the strongest economies in the world. And the Arab world has a youth bulge. And these regimes that a lot of Western countries empower and indulge and enable, uh, they are they are trying to suppress this youth bulge. But what happens is you have people trying to flee, even risking their lives to flee. You have extremism. You have uh, a lot of suppression. There's no, if you look at women's rights, Arabic-speaking countries in the Middle East are at the very absolute bottom in women's rights. In terms of education, political participation, um, healthcare. If you look at the uh, World World Economic Forum report of 2018, so there's really dire situation for the region. Um, some of the like, okay. So I just want to touch on some of the work you're doing with, um, or some of the stuff you're working on. Sorry, uh, you're like the 
you know, fighting extremism. Like I know you're, you said you mentioned you're on the advisory board of Ideas Beyond Borders, which if you want to explain a little bit what they do, but I like I just I'd read a report recently and it was in the Atlantic, and it was about how that you know okay in the Levant ISIS has lost hold, but a lot of these people are going back to the countries and the region they came from, and they're going to start now working locally instead of trying to build a global caliphate do something locally to you know turn the whole region into what isis had turned parts of the levant into and so like trying to like fight extremism like you said especially with something like ideas born borders what they're doing by sending information in there i mean i don't hear anyone talking about that really okay you know you hear oh trump's defeated isis but you don't hear yeah but these people are going back or if you look at uh, you know, Africa now, uh, in the Congo, ISIS is setting up a foothold there. Like, I mean, these extremist ideas are getting out. So, absolutely. So, if it wasn't for uh, which Obama started, the, the U.S. military campaign that stopped the sweeping progress of ISIS, which was already in Iraq and Syria, if it wasn't for the actual military campaign, God knows where, where this group would be, because... They were sweeping two countries. That is no small achievement. So unless we go after the ideas, if we just continually just want to eliminate people who hold these ideas, then the battle will go for another 20 years. We, we've, been having, we've been fighting terrorism for 20 years almost, and it will go for another 20 years unless we go again at the bottom of, of, of this issue, which is ideas. Ideas can change. I have interviewed so many former extremists who used to hold ideas, like many that joined ISIS fighters, and who are now major spokespeople for humanism and human rights, and they're doing a lot of, uh, a lot of work among their peers to also spread humanism among them. So ideas can change, people can change. But if we just focus on the military solution, which it is important, without the military solution, again, ISIS would continue to, to uh, sweep even more countries. But at the ideas realm, again, we continue to support regimes that support uh, extremist or, or ideas with extremist undertones all over the Muslim world. You know, Farah Bandef was the State Department representative of, um, of the Muslim world. And she went to over 80 countries. She wrote about this in the New York Times. Recently, she has an article in Foreign Policy called something, I think, um, Terrorism or Extremism is Riyadh's first... Let me see, I may even have it here. Yeah, it is Extremism is Riyadh's top export. And everywhere she went, uh, she heard stories of basically mainly Saudi, but Gulf money in general, being invested in schools and mosques that preach extremism. And then we wonder why tens of thousands of young people from Muslim communities all over the world leave their countries or, or communities to join terrorism. There's an investment in billions of dollars. So are we investing billions of dollars to spread ideas that actually counter terrorist ideas? We're not. So you mentioned ideas beyond borders. So. The Arab Human Development Report, the UN Arab Human Development Report, has been issuing reports about the state of affairs in the Arab world for a few years now. And the latest one was issued in uh, end of 2016, in which it detailed, like all the ones before it, the phenomenal knowledge deficit in the Arab world. There's no investment in knowledge except in extremist knowledge by Gulf countries, mainly Saudi spreading Wahhabism. So there's no investment in education. So what Ideas Beyond Borders is doing is that it's recruiting some of the most phenomenal thought leaders in the world, in the Western world, and getting rights to uh, publish their work for free in Arabic. So for example, among these intellectuals who give Ideas Beyond Borders license to, to translate and disseminate for free their books uh, is Steven Pinker, and his book, Enlightenment Now, is about reason and humanism and progress, and it will be available in Arabic very soon. 
for anybody who has a smart machine, uh, whether a smartphone, which you know, smart smartphone uh, dissemination is quite uh, wide. So, uh, so we are about spreading knowledge. We are about allowing good ideas to spread to compete with bad ideas. So, I, I, organizations like Ideas Beyond Borders, we're at the mercy of finding funders, for example, <laughs> who would support translating these books. So again, if anybody is listening and is interested in translating books, and that person could be interested in certain kind of books, science, history, philosophy, whatever the donor wants, as long as it's as as long as it's humanist and uh, preaches um, and empowers peaceful ideas and good ideas that uh, motivate people to want to be an asset to humanity, not not somebody who wants to engage with violent violence. So this is what Ideas Beyond Borders is about. Um, yeah. Um, just a quick, because I, I mean, okay, like I obviously am not following it like you are. I'm not an academic. I, this is not a field of study for me, but just because it is something that is important to me and I want, you know, I believe in enlightenment values. I believe in, you know, the like liberal secular democracies. So, but when I see things in the Middle East, um, I'm a little heartened because I do see young people speaking out. I do see, you know, like especially what's going on in Iran the last couple of years with the, you know, White Wednesdays and my stealthy freedom and then, you know, people, more and more people speaking out against the government, even though there are some other issues there. But but then I look at South Asia, I look at Pakistan and I mean, I, I keep using this example because it's so, to me, it's so emblematic. There was a small error in... Um, the oath of office, a clerical area that they took out one line which said, Muhammad is the last prophet. And the reason they have that line is to stop the Ahmadis from becoming politicians. Now, this happened a, cu a couple of oh. years ago. Mm -hmm. When that came out, the population started riding at a seeming relaxation from the government. It wasn't even like the government relaxing anything. The population just assumed that mm -hmm. it was. And the population overreacted. And then the military was called in and the military sided with the population. So... All this money that you're talking about, like I, I've seen it in South Asia. I, I grew up in India. I go back, or I was born in India. I was raised there till I was six. I keep going back. You know, I've been to parts of South Asia. Uh, you know, I worked in Afghanistan uh, for seven years, like you know, with NATO. I, I've seen all this kind of stuff and see the Saudi money going in there, and Saudis creating something that they that might come back to bite them in the ass. I mean, you know, their their population might want some freedom. But then they're creating something else in another part of the world that might just come back to infect them even more. I mean, I don't know uh, if, if that should be our worry, what's happening inside Saudi, but what's really troubling is what is happening everywhere else around the world. Everywhere, in every metro, there is not a single metropolitan on earth on, that has not had... Uh, terrorism almost terrorist attacks and this is with billions of dollars whether it's europe asia the middle east africa uh, every continent is suffering from terrorist attacks as a result of this ideology so uh and billions and billions of dollars that could go to healthcare, that could go to education that could go to all sorts of other things are being directed to stop terrorist attacks and they still continue to happen so I was just in Barcelona two weeks ago, and it, you know the the main uh, touristic touristic uh, road. I think it's called Ramblas. They had to put huge concrete things to stop uh, vans from driving into pedestrians because two years earlier, a terrorist basically drove a van, killing people on the street. Tourists, you know, civilians. Who knows who, where they're from, what religion they are. I mean, it's blind hate that is that all it wants is to kill indiscriminately. There, there's nothing good that can come out of such an ideology. It's not interested in engaging in debate. It's not interested in. It's a, if, if you, to make a point, are willing to kill civilian pedestrians, regardless of what their situation is, who they are as human beings, to have such complete disregard for the other. I mean, it's such. It's an ideology that has such arrogance and such sense of entitlement to even everybody else's life. So 
it, it's it's troubling that this ideology is everywhere on the globe. I, I don't honestly care. I mean, what what it's doing in Saudi because I mean, Saudi is a closed society. There's there's no freedom of thought or expression or religion or any kind of freedom. So, but when they spread that kind of ideology everywhere else in the world, that is a world problem. It's no longer just a Saudi problem. This is a world issue, and the international community continues to just turn the other cheek because a small group of people are getting billions worth of uh, weapons to Saudi. They don't care if these weapons kill, starve, destroy. All they care about is the profit they make. So it, it's very troublesome, and, and these kind of short, short-term profit-motivated policies, a lot of people pay for them. Millions and millions pay for them. Yeah, I mean, that's... Uh, I don't know, the, 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 like the extremism everything that comes out of it again i i don't know if it was i i, I don't want to lay blame or say it was fault but you know like myself i i only started speaking out about some of this stuff in 2014 i was working overseas and i got back to north america in 2014 and that's when i really kind of speak started speaking out but i focused on terrorism um and you know anytime there was a terrorist attack i was like well, well look at this this is the ideology that's doing it and I'm not saying it's bad to focus on it, but I think at certain points we kind of we might have done ourselves a disservice by just focusing on the terrorism instead of focusing on everything else that'll lead up to it. Um, I, I can't remember the the name of the scholar, but he was from Al Azhar, and he said that you know the reason Al Azhar does not denounce an ISIS is because ISIS is a product of Al Azhar, right? So you you if you cannot go to the, you know, the underpinnings of everything else, like, uh, you know, blasphemy laws, apostasy laws, anything that says, if you disagree with me, I'm going to have to burn you down or kill you. Like, those are the things you have to try to fight because, frankly, I don't know, if you if you get to the point of counterterrorism, I think we've already kind of lost it because you're then being reactionary instead of, like, you know, being proactive to do something. Absolutely. You're right on. I mean, apostasy laws are an excuse to silence anybody who thinks differently. And these these laws have led to the death of phenomenal human beings. In fact, my PhD was about one of these people, Nasr Hamid Abu Zaid, who, he is a pious scholar. This is somebody self-proclaimed Muslim, practicing Muslim with very deep spirituality. If you read his books, especially his books on uh, on Sufism, somebody who's deeply spiritual. And he was deemed an apostate. His, he was divorced from his wife by force. He had to flee into exile to, uh, you know, to save his life. So that is shameful. And Al-Azhar just stood there watching. That is really shameful. And this is one of a, a, a huge list of scholars and thinkers, poets, artists, that have been silenced, that have been um, forced into exile, that have been killed. So it's it's really tragic. And it, I agree with you that this, this mentality of silencing, silencing the other through violence is at the root of terrorism because there's no legal system in many Muslim countries to stop that. In, in fact, to my knowledge, there may be rhetorical condemnations, but actual codified legal system to protect individual rights I don't believe they exist in any Muslim majority countries. There's always the, the person is sacrificed in the name of apostasy, in the name of all sorts of religious slogans that are applied to some but not others, and that are clearly used by some theologians against those uh, they deem too different. Yeah, and I mean, there's also, you know, they're, they're, they change a definition. Like, like Saudi Arabia, okay, we're going to fight terrorism, and then they make atheism a terrorist defense, and they say, yeah, now we're fighting terrorism by putting atheists in prison. I mean, it's it's just like this sleight of hand, like, you know, look, look, we're fighting terrorism, but we're you're not really, you know. Like, just... Absolutely. And then any, again, any poet, any any thinker, any can easily be accused of atheism. I mean, any any person, no matter how pious, no matter what their Islamic credentials, can be accused of apostasy by an extremist group, or even so-called mainstream regime supported theologian okay, I, I want to just shift a little bit because this is something that's been bugging me for a while 
and it's okay the term like Arab countries and the, the reason it's bugging me is I was just in an argument with someone we were looking up the list of Arab countries and they included Somalia and Sudan and I'm like in how way you know, how are these countries Arab you know, and the argument start, stemmed from me saying that North Africa is not technically really Arab countries. You know, they're, they're, they are Arab speaking by conquest. They have Arab, you know, people with Arab blood in them. But, you know, originally there were Berbers and Copts. You know, like they are not ethnically Arab by origin. And it just, this, I don't know if it came out of like the pan Arabism in the 60s or where it all that came from, but... Again, at least Somalia and Sudan. Like, how the hell can you call those Arab countries? <laughs> I mean, that's a, a really interesting point. I mean, and it's really related a little bit to the hegemonic rhetoric and very hegemonic identity that doesn't allow for differences. So North Africans, the Amazir, for example, in North Africa, are really fighting for, you know, uh, for uh, recognition. And it took a long, long, long time. It wasn't until recently that they were even allowed to teach uh, officially, recognize their, their own language. So there's there's a hegemony, there's a, there can only be one thing. And for me, when I say Arabic, I really mean Arabic speaking, because it's really important to, to recognize the diversity that exists in the, Arab, in the Arabic speaking world. There's so much diversity. And again, diversity is the opposite of, of trying to impose a hegemonic which is what extremists want to do, right? They want to try to impose one, one vision, one interpretation, one version of whatever their idea is. This is what extremism is. Extremism and diversity cannot exist hand in hand. So it's important to recognize the, the, uh, the uh, diversity that exists within the Arabic-speaking uh, countries, whether it's, you know... Uh, with Kurds and Arabs and Amazigh, and I think there's and it, uh, the diversity of the Middle East is one of the most beautiful things about the Middle East, and it's tragic that we didn't even know about the depth of this diversity until a lot of these communities became victims, like the Yazidis in Iraq. I have I have lived most of my life in the Middle East. I've never heard of them, and their tradition that goes to thousands of years, way predates Islam. So. I have never even heard of them. How come something, you know, that is interesting, part of our communities, I've never heard of them? Like there's, I was taught, you know, as if everybody was just Sunni and everybody else who's not is is uh, basically somebody who went astray that is not worthy. Of. And we have to recognize this diversity. The, the Arab hegemonic identity has to give up that attempt to force that Arab identity and, and let people claim their own identity. And, you know, other... Other people have had that, you know, in Europe, if you look at, at, at how many changes Europe uh, has undergone in the, in, in the 20th century, how many countries have. So I think that this is beginning to change and that diversity, sorry, diverse, diverse identities are really uh, being empowered, especially with access to information online. So like, for example, and this has started I mean, even in the 19th century, if you look at scholars like Tahtawi, for example, who is the uh, the father of modern education in Egypt, this is somebody who studied in France, was very impacted by Enlightenment thought, who translated a lot of uh, French philosophy into Arabic. He was he was a, a religious authority also from Al Azhar. So this man went back to to basically. Uh, make a huge impact in Egypt. And because of him, boys and girls started to get educated side by side. He wanted women to be part of the public sphere. And the way to do this is to educate them. So he wrote, he was very proud of his Egyptian identity. And he wrote that we're Egyptian, we're not Arab, we're Egyptian. And uh, so I think there are, these these calls again are, are uh, marginalized but in, in a real, in, in a space where ideas can compete freely and can exist and every idea, as long as it's not violent, has the idea to, to exist in its own merit and, and engage with other ideas. So I think we'll see more, I, I definitely see more and more of this, definitely. Yeah, I mean, just a little aside on a bit of good news on that front, 
this is a, from an article from the 11th uh, uh, what Morocco has approved to make Amazir uh, an official yeah. language so yeah I mean, it's, that's, it's an excellent step uh, uh, to recognize a rich history of, of Morocco that has been marginalized absolutely just kind of staying on this because it was something you brought up and it's it's something I you know mentioned a few times it's uh, this wiping out of cultures uh, I, I, I worked in Afghanistan I went to just outside of Kabul where the Bamiyan Buddhas were so I went to the enclaves where they used to mm. stand so you look at something like that you look at um, what ISIS did in Palmyra both those or you know both the Taliban al-Qaeda and then ISIS would go through museums destroying stuff and then selling some of it to make money but it's I mean this fear of a oh, thousand year old statues that if you're so afraid that a thousand year old statue is going to leave people from your faith like you don't have confidence in your faith you know it's I, I think it's actually even more sophisticated than that because if you wipe out people's history it, it's very easy to manipulate them to rule them to put in them whatever ideas you want because you wiped out their history yeah imagine uh, if, if somebody wipes out your history and doing this to a country destroying its its civilizational heritage it's by design incredibly insidious. It wipes out the relationship between a nation and the roots. You know, that I, is a traumatic experience. Sorry, I just want to say, I, I just, don't mean to interrupt, but I, I've said that exact same point. I got a lot of pushback for it. I said, it's one of the worst things ISIS did was to wipe out the history of a local people. Like you mentioned the Yazidi, when, you know, a lot of the things, whenever they were going back to their communities, one of the first things they did was rebuild the temples. Not that I'm a religious person or mm. that, mm -hmm. you know, but, it's that history and that connection. I, 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 sorry, I'm going to let you continue because I 100% I agree. It's, I think it's one of the worst things they did. And I really, I really love that the UNESCO, that UNESCO initiative, to uh, to consider a lot of these ruins worldwide as a human civilizational heritage. It doesn't belong to just, you know, like if you take Petra in Jordan, for example, it doesn't just belong to Jordanians. It's part of a human history. It's a, it's a phenomenal place, thousands of years old, or the pyramids in Egypt. It doesn't just belong to one country. It really belongs to all of humanity. It's part of all of our story, a collective story. Yeah, I mean, it's where we came from. Uh, same thing, okay, like Greece, the Parthenon. I mean, you know, Western thought kind of came out of that hill, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's to wipe it out, I mean... Uh, that's one of my favorite things to do. I, I love traveling and, you know, you can go to the touristy places, whatever. And some of these places are touristy, but, you know, like going through like the jungles in Cambodia and checking out the temples there or, you know, things like that. Like there's so much that I still want to see that I don't want to see wiped out. And again, like I said, it's, I still, I still think it's one of the worst things I just did is to, to destroy that history, to destroy a people's past and, you know, completely take it away from them. Absolutely. Um, so, I want to actually maybe focus a bit on your work because I know you talk like you mentioned a bit about that um, um, the, the the case study you'd written. But so, so are are you teaching Middle Eastern history, or what exactly are you teaching at Kansas State right now? So, I am an intellectual historian by training. My area of study specifically is intellectual history of Islam. And I'm looking uh, specifically also on progressive thinkers or modernist thinkers, thinkers who, you know, the, the natural way of societies is that they progress to adjust to their times. That is a natural thing. That is the natural uh, direction of life, if you would. What is not natural is, again, to have these phenomenal uh, uh, investment in trying to freeze time and not allow people to progress, not allow people to uh, basically continue to make their religion relevant to their, to their daily lives. So progressive thinkers who believe in a humanist, humane version of spirituality, of religion in general, in countries that still believe in outdated forms and outdated ways of being, including you know, forcing somebody to 
to uh, dress a certain way or force or the threat of violence constantly on daily basis to make somebody uh, apply and live by somebody else's version of what religion is, what spirituality is. So I focus on progressive Islam and the challenges that they face and the greatest challenge that almost all thinkers in Muslim communities face is apostasy and uh, these these uh, blasphemy laws because anybody who gets anywhere near reforming ideas uh, is most likely will be victim of such calls by conservative or extremists. So for example, one very famous case is uh, Faraj Foda in Egypt. He's an intellectual who uh, called for reforming Islamic thought and he uh, criticized the role of the religious institutions and he was deemed an apostate by a major theologian uh, and what happened is one extremist who didn't even read his work but he believed in the religious decree of, of the person who who gave that label apostate and he gunned down that intellectual in broad daylight while his son is sitting right next to him in the car so so the greatest obstacle to reforming Islamic thought is really oppression, is apostasy and, and blasphemy laws. But there are brilliant scholars, but again, like sadly, they, they, don't, have, um, they don't have platforms. A lot of conservative theologians have television stations and you know they have time on TV, they have time on the radio, they have, but people, Never hear, you know, thinkers like Nasr Hamid Abu Zaid or Muhammad Arkun or they don't hear them. They don't know them. They have no idea who they are. They don't know what they stand for. So there's a, there's disproportionate amount of attention and 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 space giving to such authors in favor of more conservative, more uh, traditional, more uh, less tolerant version of Islam. Okay. Just and again, this is only from you know my reading as a layperson. Uh, I mean, but that's going back a while now. I mean, you've always had scholars, and I think it's scholars that would have helped you know the populations. Like you can't read Ibn Khaldun in the Middle East, as far as I understand. You know, you can't read Avicenna. Well, luckily, right now, luckily there are a lot of great works that are being uh, published online. So the reason, I think this is really related to the Arab Spring, in my opinion, because a lot of young people are having access to financial works, and there are some brilliant visionary people, like, for example, Hindawi, Ahmed Hindawi and his wife, Nagwa Hindawi, they, they buy legally the rights to great works written by uh, Arabic-speaking scholars. And they are they built one of the most phenomenal libraries, free libraries online, where anybody can download uh, books from 19th century thinkers all the way to current intellectuals. So there are people like him, visionaries. So all of a sudden, there are a lot of people exposed to phenomenal works because the Middle East is not a place where there are public libraries. There's a lot of investments in tall buildings and all sorts of concrete, but not in human beings. So, but there are visionaries who are, and before that, there's a lot of young people that just basically uh, uh, pirate, which is not good, but I have heard many um, intellectuals express gratitude for the piracy because it allowed, it allowed uh, ideas to disseminate because there's no, 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 uh, again, no uh, easy access to knowledge. And one author, Ahla Mustaghani, she dedicated a whole book to her pirates, thanking them for disseminating her novel. Yeah, because, you know, like the greatest, as somebody who's working on a book, what you want more than anything is to have your ideas be out there and be debated. And, you know, so so if, if there's censorship of your ideas, uh, you know, we spend a lot of time... <laughs> Trying to write a book, so yeah, okay. I mean, I, I I'm not trying to promote piracy here at all, but I, I could see that. Like, if you have a book that's out and you know it's being sold in the West, whatever, great. But you want it 
for an audience in the Middle East, let's just say. Yes. I think you would be Middle happier. Yeah, yeah, I think you would be happier that the ideas got out even though you didn't make some money from that region, right? I mean, this is why visionaries like Steven Pinker and all sorts of other thinkers are giving ideas beyond borders the right to disseminate these books for free. Because what's happening is when you allow these brilliant ideas to disseminate for free, then you're, you're creating a generation where we can have copyrights and, you know, in, in the West, in Western countries that have law abiding, you know, law and order, knowledge industry is a huge industry. There are more and more books published every year. There's copyrights. People buy billions worth of money in Kindle books and audio books and paperback books. And so knowledge industry is massive in, in authoritarian uh, countries. That is not feasible right now, but when we spread good ideas, it could be feasible in a few decades. Uh, with any of the work you've done, have you seen like a generational um, split in the sense that? Absolutely. Uh, but I also and in fact, not just me. If you, you know, uh, Juan Cole wrote a book called "The New Arabs," talking about the generation of the Arab Spring. Uh, if you, if you read the work of Mark Lynch at George Washington University. He have documented also that generational gap, and in his uh, book on the Arab Spring, he he talks a lot about the younger generation. So, without a doubt, there's a generation that grew up with access to information, ability to to reach out to others, ability to connect with people, not only within the borders of its own countries, but also to other uh, globally, abilities to access. Uh, ability to, to interact you know if you were I, I can't tell you how many people I've met who their route uh, against terrorism started when somebody challenged them and they couldn't silence that person by force which is what they're taught they couldn't defend quote unquote their idea by violence so they had to engage at the intellectual level because the other person is behind a computer screen so then they had to find an equally good idea so so then you really lean on your intellectual side, your persuasion. You, you, you cannot yell at somebody. You cannot. You have to use persuasion. You have to use evidence. And that is basically the Internet. I know it has a lot of side effects in the West, but, but in fact, the Internet in authoritarian regimes, when it's open somewhat, it is causing a rewiring of a whole generation. That is definitely the case in the Middle East which is why we need to protect internet freedom. We need to make sure that country, that, that, uh, that uh, companies, especially IT companies, recognize the importance of protecting that space and not work to enable authoritarian regimes to suffocate that space because humanity does not stand to win when these regimes have their way. Quite the opposite. We've seen what they've done uh, spreading extremist ideas all over the world we all pay just uh sticking with this do you see a difference in like if I, if you were to ask maybe about 15 or 20 years ago if people wanted secular governments in the middle east they would automatically assume secularism within four secularism and you know dictatorships like assad or hussein whether or not those guys were religious but they would work under the you know auspices of a secular government like, do you see a difference in that? Like, with the younger people now thinking of secularism as just that, the separation of church and state, and something that can't be enforced? Whereas... Absolutely. Without a question, if you look at the Arab Spring, the absence of religious slogans is really telling, even though religious discourse is very hegemonic. Again, it's supported by billions of weapons. You cannot escape it. And yet, the Arab Spring was, was peaceful, was inclusive, was, it wasn't anti-religion, but religion was absent. And that is a huge statement. I think more and more, especially young people, want separation between politics and religion, without a question. And if you look at, and how, how you know this actually, if you analyze the discourse, people want civic government, not religious government, civic government. This is as far, as close as you can get to saying, I don't want religious state, I want civic. What does that mean? Non-religious. That is a huge statement. That is an enormous slap to the Islamist agenda, in fact. Okay. Um, 
I don't want to keep you too, too long. I've had you here for a while, thank you. but thank you very much for coming on. I just wanted to you know, give you the last word. If you have any, you know, words of encouragement or, you know, what your thoughts on possibly what might happen. I know predicting the future is <laughs> very, very chancy, but like, where, what are your feelings about what's going to be happening in the Middle East coming up? You know, I, I really think what would happen in the Middle East depends hugely on what each of us does. We live at a time where we really are empowered with our ability to connect with others, uh, our ability to tell their stories if they can't, our ability to vote with, with not just voting in elections, to elect politicians who respect the human rights, who would not aid dictators in in spreading terrorism around the world. Who, So every little thing we do as global citizens can make or break, not just the Middle East, uh, collectively, you know, we are all connected. What happens anywhere impacts all of us. So I think we need to take this personal responsibility very, very seriously and do each one of us, no matter where we are, whether we are, you know, in Kansas or do as much as we can individually to be on the right side of history because it does make a difference. People do make a difference. All right. Well, thank you very much. And if you want to let people know where they can reach you on social media, and if you want to send me any of the links to any of the stuff you've mentioned, um, I might reach out to you again and I can put all those links in the description. That sounds great. Yeah. Ideas Beyond Borders is a a great way to, uh, you know, you can donate to translate a book. That would be great. And uh, I can be followed on Twitter. And my contact information also is available publicly as a professor at Kansas State University. All right. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for listening. My pleasure.